Imagine that this rough circle here is a perfectly round hard circle centered at the origin with a ball balanced at the unstable point of equilibrium at the top. And then imagine it's tipped off to the right with an infinitesimal bump, and we only need an infinitesimal bump because it's an unstable point of equilibrium. This setup allows us to take the initial angle to be zero, and the initial angular velocity to also be zero, which is an initial condition we'll use later. Now as it falls, it'll pick up momentum, and eventually have enough to lose contact with the disk and our task is to calculate at what y direction height does that happen. This might sound like a tricky problem to solve, but it turns out there's actually an easy way to do it with Lagrange multipliers, where we first solve for the angle at which it happens, and then plug that into the formula we have for the y coordinate down here, which is given by standard trigonometry. However, before we can get to anything with Lagrange multipliers, we of course need to calculate the Lagrangian. Given the circular nature of this problem, polar coordinates are the obvious choice for the generalized coordinates, giving us these velocities. We can then work out the kinetic energy as usual. We have two terms that cancel, and then some simplification from the Pythagorean trig identity, ultimately giving us this expression for the kinetic energy, which may be familiar to you if you've worked with polar coordinates in the past in the study of other systems. The potential energy is quite easy, it's just mgy, as is usual in gravitational systems, and we've already used trigonometry to calculate y, so we can just plug that in. Then the usual Lagrangian is t minus v, giving us this result. With the Lagrangian in hand, the next step is to figure out how to use it to answer the question we set out to answer. We know that while the ball is still on the wheel, this constraint applies, and we know we can impose this constraint any time it does apply using Lagrange multipliers, leaving us with this modified Lagrangian. We can then calculate the equations of motion from this Lagrangian instead of the original one. If we combine that with the constraint equation, we're left with a system of three equations for three unknowns. The two degrees of freedom that we're used to, theta and r, and then also this lambda quantity. While we're still considering the domain where the constraint applies, we're free to simplify our problem by eliminating r in the second and third equations using the first one. This leaves us with these two equations. We're technically able to do that in any case where we've got three equations with three unknowns. The reason why we do it here as opposed to in some other cases where we might choose not to is because this particular constraint equation happens to make eliminating one of the degrees of freedom especially easy, so it's worth doing. And it's these equations directly that we can actually use to solve the problem that we wanted to solve. The strategy for finding the height from these equations works as follows. Lambda is zero when the ball falls off because the constraint stops applying. Therefore, if we solve for lambda in terms of theta, which we do instead of theta in terms of lambda because it happens to be algebraically easier in this case, as you'll see, then set lambda equal to zero, we can then solve for theta c, the critical angle at which the ball falls off the circle. This can then be inserted back into this formula for y to get the height. Solving for lambda in terms of theta begins with this funky calculus trick leveraging the chain rule that ultimately shows that theta dot dot d theta can be written as theta dot d theta dot, allowing us to turn this equation here into an integrable one. And it's at this point that we need those initial conditions that I talked about at the beginning. At t equals zero, theta equals zero, and theta dot equals zero, which means this constant c must equal g over a for the whole thing to be consistent. We can then insert this back into the first equation, ultimately getting us this equation for lambda in terms of theta, which is what we were going for. We've already argued that lambda equals zero gives us the critical angle, so all we have to do is apply that to this equation and get solving. We find that the critical angle is the arc cosine of two-thirds, which implies that the height we're looking for is 2a over 3, and that's our final answer. That's how you can use Lagrange multipliers to calculate when a constraint stops applying in a system where a constraint applies for only part of the time evolution. I hope this video is interesting. Thanks for watching.